If you want to learn structural engineering and you want to do it in the quickest and most optimal way possible, the nine topics I'm going to share with you in this video are the ones you need to focus on. These topics are the ones that you're actually going to use after you graduate. They're the ones that employers look for and value the most in new graduates, and they're the ones that'll give you the greatest return on investment for all the time and effort you put into them. For context, I've been in the engineering world for over seven years now and currently work at a mid-sized structural engineering firm that designs high rises all the way down to residential houses. Over the last few years, I've personally designed lots of timber, steel, and concrete framed homes, a bunch of industrial steel and concrete framed warehouses, and also helped out on some high rise projects too. Before this, I was at a large global company for a year doing mainly steel frame structures. And while I was at university, I did two internships one at a small company and the other at a large. Also, while I was at uni, I spent a crap load of hours studying trying to get the best grades possible and ended up graduating with class one honors and the university medal for academic achievement. But I definitely made it to where I am the long way. And that's why in this video, I'm gonna cut out all the fluff and just cover the essentials. That way, those of you that want to learn structural engineering fast, will know what's worth your time. All right, now to get started learning structural engineering, the first topic you'll need to get your head around is engineering mechanics. Here you're gonna to wanna to focus on understanding things like how different support types work and what reactions they provide, how to draw and solve free body diagrams, how to sketch shear force and bending moment diagrams and how these diagrams change under different loading and support arrangements, how to solve trusses using the method of joints and the method of sections, and also how to calculate different section properties like the centroid and the second moment of area. Now, as this is the first topic, this probably goes a bit without saying, but these concepts really are the foundation of everything you do later on. Even in my work now, seven years after I originally learned this stuff, I'm still doing things like drawing and solving free body diagrams either by hand or by using software, and also doing things like analyzing bending moment and shear force diagrams. Early on, I think a lot of people, myself included, thought that a lot of this stuff would would be superseded by more important things, but realistically, everything just builds off this stuff. Also, before I get too far ahead of myself, in the video description, I will put a whole bunch of links to resources you can actually use to learn everything I mentioned on each topic. So be sure to have a look at this later if you want any of my suggestions. Anyways, next up is mechanics and materials. And this is all about understanding how materials behave when you apply forces to them. Here you're gonna need to focus on things like stress and strain and how they relate to each other using Hooke's law, Young's modulus and the section modulus different types of internal forces like axial, bending, shear, and torsional stress, and how these forces cause different types of deformation. You're also gonna to need to learn things like how to calculate a beam's deflection and what factors affect how much a beam will deflect, the flexure formula, and also some advanced topics like combined stress and column buckling. Even if you don't go deep into these advanced ones right away, it's worth knowing that they exist. Over time, they'll become less daunting and you'll understand them better the more exposure you get. Okay, so topic number three is structural design. And this is where you'll get your first real taste of some practical structural engineering. This topic is all about understanding how to calculate and apply loads to a structure and finding the worst combination of loading. In topic one and two, part of what you would have learned is how to calculate the resulting internal forces and deflections based off some given loading. But in this topic, you're actually gonna learn how to find that loading yourself. So this means you need to learn how to calculate dead loads, live loads, wind loads, earthquake loads, and maybe even snow loads. And then you need to learn how to find a member's tributary area so that you can apply the correct amount of loading. The process of working out how much load a member is taking is really something that needs to be done with as much precision as possible because the load you assume at this stage will govern what is output when finding design actions. And design actions, for those of you that are super new to all this, could be something like the largest possible bending moment under the worst possible combination of loading. To work out your design actions, you need to combine different design loads like dead and live load. And to make things a little bit more complex, when you combine your design loads to find your design action, your design loads need to be factored to add an additional layer of safety. The amount each design load gets factored by does change depending on the code you're working from. So you will need to check this depending on where you're designing for. Usually you'll end up with a bunch of different load combinations and out of these combos, it'll be your job to find the worst one. Once you've actually got your design actions, you then compare them against the capacity of your members, which 
which you'll learn how to do in later topics. In any case though, the trick here is to make sure that the design action is less than the design capacity with an appropriate factor of safety. That's pretty much structural design in a nutshell. Anyhow, one more thing you'll get introduced to here is ultimate limit state design and serviceability limit state design. The first is about strength and the second is about usability. Things like deflection, vibration, or cracking that might not cause failure but still affect performance. Again, this is one of those procedures that structural engineers do daily. So while this may have all sounded confusing just now, after you've done it a couple of times, you'll start to get the hang of how it all comes together. Now, before we can move on to working out the capacity of different types of members, there's one more fundamental that we need to cover, and that's structural analysis. What this is, is basically just a more advanced version of engineering mechanics. Here you'll need to focus on learning things like what makes a structure stable and how frames deflect and distribute moment under different loading, support types, and section types. Now, if you take a course on structural analysis at university, you will definitely cover a lot more than this and do things like virtual work method and influence lines but I've never used any of that stuff again directly. A lot of this extra stuff would be working behind the scenes within software programs that I use, but unless you wanna go out and write your own software program, you really don't need to remember the inner workings of this sort of content. If you stick to the essential content and just get a general understanding of the other methods that are out there, that'll prepare you perfectly fine for your working life after uni. All right, and next up is structural steel design. In this topic, you'll calculate your design actions, just like we covered earlier, then you'll build on this and check whether your steel member has enough capacity to resist those actions. During this topic, you'll need to learn how to design all the typical steel members, like roof rafters, floor beams, columns, struts, and tension members. To actually design these members, you should learn how to do it from first principles, and then you should also learn how to use the pre-established design capacity tables. Here, you're also gonna wanna learn about things like lateral torsional buckling, braced first moment resisting frames, and what type of cross sections are typically used in certain applications. You'll also get introduced to cold form steel, things like purlins and girts, which get designed a little bit differently to hot rolled steel. Now, besides members, another really important part of steel design is connection design. At a minimum, here you should be learning how to design simple beam to beam and beam to column pin connections, knee and splice connections, and also base blade and bracing connections. In the beginning, it would be good to do these from first principles so that you can get a good understanding of different bolt, weld, and plate capacities, but later on, it'll be perfectly okay to use standardized connection types or software tools to make this process easier. All right, next up, let's talk about geotechnical design. And yes, structural engineers do need to know some geotechnical stuff too. Now, here you'll wanna start by learning some basic soil mechanics. Things like cohesive soils versus cohesionless soils, unit weights, and friction angles. From there, you'll need to get an understanding of what bearing capacity and settlement is, and how these relate to the design of shallow footings like pads and strips, deep foundations like board piers, and retaining walls too. Another important thing to learn here is how to calculate lateral earth pressures, because this is what drives the design of retaining walls. Besides this, you'll also need to learn how to read geotechnical reports and interpret borehole logs, because this pretty much comes up on every project. Overall, you really don't have to get too technical when it comes to learning geotechnical stuff, because we'll leave that for the geotechnical engineers, but you do need to know enough to design foundations and retaining walls that work. All right, now the next topic that's really worth your time is concrete design. Concrete is one of the most widely used materials in construction and it's used in everything from footings to walls to pools on top of high rise buildings. As a structural engineer, this is a really important material to know. Now, to begin, you're gonna wanna start with reinforced concrete design. This is where steel bars are embedded in concrete to resist tension, while the concrete handles compression. Here, you'll need to learn how to design beams, slabs, columns, and walls. During this process, you'll cover things like flexural design, shear design, deflection analysis and crack control, and also compression design for columns and walls. You'll also learn how to determine bar spacing, bar size, development length, Length and anchorage, and how all of these things affect the performance of your element. After you've covered the traditional reinforced concrete design procedures, you should also learn about a more complex type of concrete design, which is pre-stressed concrete. I will say that not all structural engineers work with pre-stressed concrete, as it's a bit more of a specialist type of design, but I still think it's worth wrapping your head around. Personally, the company I work for does a lot of pre-stressed concrete design, so it was actually really important for me to learn. Now, one more thing I want to mention while I'm on the topic of concrete 
concrete design is something pretty similar, and that's reinforced masonry block work. Generally speaking, the overall design procedures are the same, but block work has its own set of design formulas and a separate code to follow. So this does mean that there'll be another set of formulas you need to be familiar with. If you're interested, I recently put together a new set of work examples focused on the design of reinforced block work, and I'll put a link in the video description if you'd like to check it out. Okay, now next up is timber design, and this has got to be the most underemphasized topic at university for how common it is in practice, especially here in residential design in Australia. In any case, here you'll need to learn how to calculate the bending, shear, and axial capacity of timber beams and columns, how to calculate the capacity of bolted and screwed connections, and you should also learn about the different types of timber elements, like studs, noggings, rafters, and lintels. In Australia, two of the standards which detail a lot of how this is done is AS 1684.2 and AS 1720.1. Between these two standards, you'll pretty much cover everything you need to know for member and connection design, bracing and tie down design, and also just a lot of general information, like how timber systems go together. All right, and finally, let's talk about software. As a student, you're gonna be doing a lot of things by hand, but once you enter the workforce, software becomes a big part of your job. Even though I didn't mention it during each topic, one of the best things you can do is learn software programs as you go. These days, there are countless video tutorials out there for all sorts of programs, and as a student, you can often access student versions of these programs completely for free, so very easily you should be able to get a handle on the basics. Now, for each of the topics I've gone through today, I will give you a few example programs that you can check out, but just know that certain programs are more popular than others in different parts of the world, so just be sure to do some research and find out what ones are popular where you want to work. Okay, so for steel design, a few programs you can learn are Space Gas, Autodesk Robot, and Stad Pro. For steel connections, you can take a look at RAM Connection and Idea Statica. For concrete, you've got RAM Concept, ETABS, Strand 7, and SAFE. For timber in Australia, you can use Hind Design or Structural Toolkit. And for the geotechnical stuff, you can use Tekla TEDS, SkySiv, or Structural Toolkit. Also, besides all of these, don't overlook Excel. I've personally made quite a few handy spreadsheets in Excel that I use all the time, and I actually prefer these more than software sometimes because they're so quick and handy and just easy to use. Also, if programming and AI are other tools you want to learn about too, that's where the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant, can really come in handy. In case you haven't heard of Brilliant, Brilliant is one of the top online learning platforms for STEM. They've got thousands of interactive lessons across topics like math, science, computer science, and data analysis. Within each topic, there are individual courses that have been broken down into short, bite-sized lessons that you can complete at your own pace. What I think really makes Brilliant stand out is how hands-on it is. Every lesson is interactive and designed to feel more like a game than a lecture. You're not just sitting back watching videos, you're actually solving problems as you go. Recently, I've been trying out the course Programming with Python, and already I feel like I've brushed up on a lot of content. Each lesson makes you solve problems and write scripts, so there's a lot of feedback and it's easy to start applying what you've learned. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, be sure to check them out using my link in the description, and if you decide to stick with it, you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video, now let's get back to it. In general though, when it comes to software, the main thing here is to learn it alongside the theory. That way you know what the software is actually doing behind the scenes. Otherwise, you're just typing numbers into a black box and that's not what you wanna be doing as a structural engineer. Anyways, I hope that you learned something in this video and if you did enjoy it, you might like to watch either of these two videos here where I go through some technical design in detail. As always though, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.